The idea behind Citizen Friday was repair, share, and get some fresh air. So the idea was that on, on Black Friday itself, don't go consume, go and do these things instead. They're better for your community, they're better for you, and they're better for the environment. And actually like the whole campaign went down really, really well. And I think it's because it was quite simple to be involved. You could take part in it. You, you had a role to play and has caught the, the attention of people just because of the, the situation we are in the world at the minute. And maybe people don't have as much expendable cash and spend as much money to spend stuff. So they fancy doing something maybe a bit different. Like maybe they, they want to do something that's a bit more for them or for their community. And yeah, it went, it went really, really well. And it's continued since. Today, I'm joined by Gavin Fernie Jones, a remarkable individual whose life story is a testament to embracing change, resilience and the power of community. He discovered his love for the outdoors as he grew up in the Peak District in the UK, but ended up in the French Alps managing chalets before his entrepreneurial spirit led him to open a ski boot fitting business. But as he witnessed the creeping realities of climate change emerge all around him, he began to take action through his One Tree at a Time initiative. This led to further initiatives like Citizen Fridays and now his growing Reaction Collective. As a self-described reluctant leader, Gavin is actually a proactive changemaker. Through initiatives like Citizen Fridays and the engaging community space, that champion sustainability, Gavin and his team are not only talking about change, they're living it. This is a conversation about transformation and is proof that we can all take action, make choices, have an impact and contribute to a more sustainable future. I hope that you're inspired as much as I was. Now, over to Gavin. Gavin, welcome to the Impossible Network. Hi Mark, uh, thanks for having me here. It's lovely to be talking to you today. And you are talking from where exactly? Uh, I'm talking from a small village in the French Alps called Le Grenier, right on the edge of a, uh, a larger ski resort called Courchevel. Well, let's jump in. We've established uh, what you're doing at the moment. We're going to get more into that. But let's start with a big question. Who are you as a human being? Yeah, you did send some questions over and I have to say I was a little a bit uncomfortable with this one. And mainly because I think I may be a human being that's in transition. I am a very different person to what I was eight years ago had some pretty fundamental changes happen in the last eight years of my life. And I think those changes, some of those to my family, to my work and my career, some of those changes also to the environment I live in. And I think that means I have maybe become, I have become a bit of a reluctant leader, I think. I wouldn't have imagined eight years ago that I would sit on a podcast and talk to you. And that's, that's been an interesting journey, actually. It's been quite eye-opening. I've definitely forced myself into some more uncomfortable positions in the last few years and, and challenged myself. I am by nature quite empathetic. And I think that has played into the role I've now taken on um, in the last few years and, and, and helped me massively with that. I'm a family man, so I've got two young children now, husband, and I'm in a place where I'm very, very happy and quite positive, which can sometimes feel unusual considering the, the sector I'm sort of working in and the stuff I'm learning about. It's an interesting term, a reluctant leader. Before getting into why you've become a reluctant leader and why you're in this period of transition, the second question I'd like to explore is what made you you or who made you you? I mean, this question's like quite easy, actually, and I think my parents, really, for me, are the, are the reason that I am who I am. And actually, I can probably even define that down to one decision that my parents made when I was around about 10. Uh, when I was born, we lived in, in Essex, or just on the edge of Essex, in a, in a, in a town called Bishop Stortford, so just, just north of London. Oh, yeah. My mum worked at a bank as a cashier, and my dad was a mechanic on lorries. And they, they'd always, from their childhood, gone to this organisation called the Woodcraft Folk, which is a, it's a, it's a group a bit like the Girl Guides and the, and the Scouts, but it's for both male and female. And it sort of came out of the labor movement in the 60s. So it's got a lot of, it's, it's embedded in stuff like woodcraft, in, in, in the outdoors, in nature. And they'd, all, they'd always attended these groups. And these, these groups would go on residentials to the Peak District. And they went to one particular center that's called Lockerbrook. And when I was 10, my mum and dad decided that they would apply for the job to run the center in the Peak District. So we left Essex oh, wow. and left that uh, area and moved moved to the peaks, which at the time being 10, I thought it was crazy. <laughs> so yeah. I, had to, I, 
I had a group of friends. Uh, yeah, I was in school, and all that got they, like taken out. To, like change, everything changed really. We went then. I think the biggest change is that we moved to this outdoor centre that it's off the it's up on the Snake Pass. I think it's actually the UK's highest residential building. I'm pretty sure it is. Well, not the UK, but certainly England. And at the outdoor centre, our next neighbour was a mile away, and the nearest village was 15 miles away. So, so your friend network um, became a bunch of squirrels. <laughs> Sheep, my brothers. <laughs> yeah, well, that mm-hmm. is a significant change. What about siblings? Yeah, I've got two brothers, and actually, on this day, my mum asked me. My mum has asked me a couple of times recently. A really strange question. Like, isn't a strange question because it must have like it must have been played on their mind when they made this decision as to whether it was the, the right thing to do. And my mum was like, "Oh, so when we moved to Lockerbrook, that was that was the right decision." I was like, "Are you mad? It was the best decision like ever, like bar none. Like we ended mm-hmm. up living in this incredible part of the world, outdoor, outdoor most of the time. My brother's playing in outdoor centres, so you have lots of different people coming every week. So there's you know there's constant mm-hmm. stream of groups coming through. I got qualified as a climbing instructor, so a few years of instructing in the Peak District, which was a fantastic job to be doing. Like outside all the time, the most amazing natural playground to go and play with my brothers. So, yeah, she, I, she, it obviously means something to her because she keeps asking me, "Going, was it the right decision?" They must have, they must have been really weighing it up as to whether to do it at the time. And I'm like, yeah, like I, it's one of those moments. I can't imagine what I would have become if I had stayed down south because I don't think we would have got into like the outdoor sport. Yeah, that's incredible. Why did they decide to do it? Was it for your benefit, children's benefit? Or did they have a hankering to live in the outdoors, the wilds? Because that's a radical change, a pivot for them from a mechanic and a cashier to suddenly uproot their life and go to make such a dramatic life change. And, and when they went to this centre, they went to a centre that was just a residential centre, really struggling, like struggling to, to make ends meet. They went and then my dad got qualified really quickly in all the outdoor sports like caving, canoeing, kayaking, climbing introduced outdoor sports to the center so before it was just a place where you'd go in and stay and you would just play in the outdoors around it and then he got qualified mm-hmm. and started to offer the groups those sort of activities so it's like a massive leap from like i like say from a key mechanic and cashier to something really really different and i mean they 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 had to do some pretty big bits of driving for us and stuff for example because they always said that, that when they'd moved there they would never like they would never let it impinge on what we wanted to do. So if I wanted to do a sports club, which was around the valley in Hope Valley, 25 miles away, they were just like, yeah. And if that meant staying after school, <laughs> my dad would come and get me in the, I know now, like <clears throat> they had a mile, it had a mile long track up to it, like a really um, rough track that was self-maintained by the center. So it was really rough and we had to do a lot of work on it all the time, but it had four gates on it. And I always think to myself, the amount of times my dad must have stopped to open that gate, to drive through, to play that gate, to go and do the next one, to just come and pick me up from like football club or something. <laughs> so like, yeah, wow. I, they, that must have been massively pivotal in my life because they introduced me to the outdoors, which I just would, wouldn't have. So that love of the outdoors, how did it play a significant part? I've interviewed a number of people that have grown up in the different wilds of countryside and gone on to very different careers so your your path has, has been very much focused on the outdoors and adventure uh, sports yeah. and s- skiing i suppose snowboarding why that path i think some of it might be tied up in the physical sports itself so if you take like the sport of climbing in, in the peak district it's quite an unusual cl- like sport in the peak district because it's really really short climbs but it's not protected so if you're climbing here in the Alps, there's bolts that you can clip into. It's a safety, like screwed into the rock. In the Pink District, because of the nature of the rock, you place your own gear. So you'll put like a, a nut in a crack or a friend, just like a camming device in a crack. And some of the some of the stuff's just unprotectable. So you're climbing, all right, small heights up to like 25 meters, but unprotectable. So you know, mm. and, and the landing the landing area is a flat. It's a <laughs> it's a boulder field. So I think. I learned a hell of a lot from some of those outdoor sports like climbing. I started to understand my limits or my capabilities or how to get myself in the right frame of mind to maybe tackle a quite a, a dangerous and difficult climb at like quite a young age. Mm-hmm. And 
I guess I had quite a lot of freedom with my parents. I would have been up up there with my brothers at the age of 16, 17, 18, like teaching ourselves how to climb. Like my dad would give us some tips from his instructor and stuff, but there was a certain amount of letting us go and go and learn from it. So I think those outdoor sports, they do prepare you well for life in a way. They do challenge you. They do make you understand risk. I suppose it makes you confront your fear and know your limits yes. of, uh, of where your fear limit is. Yeah. And people would say, I guess, with climbers and, that, and especially looking at like professional climbers now that are doing some really, really crazy solo in on places like El Capitan and stuff. Alex, Alex Honnold and Free Solo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah, crazy. incredible watching him. And- it's crazy and incredible watching him, but I know that he knows he can do that. And I know that he's been through the training and got to that level and he is confident and comfortable that he can do that. And I wasn't soloing anywhere near that level, but I was definitely soloing. And you, you approach it and you train and you, and, you, and you work towards that level and you, to what someone else might sit thinking, you're doing something that somebody else might think is really, really crazy, but actually you know in your mind that you can do it. So you do it. And I think some of that, it really, it's really, really useful for the rest of your life. Like it's a good grounding and a, and a good bed for what you go on to do. Other than that, I, I just love being outdoors. You said if you, you can't imagine where you would be now if you parent if your parents hadn't made that switch and they'd stayed in Bishop Stortford and you'd grown up outside North London and in a suburban environment. Do you recall what it was like in when you were before you moved to the the, the Peak District? If you had an adventurous sort of attitude to life, where you're always out in the outdoors, even there with your friends, getting into mischief. Oh, I've always liked sports. So when we were living in Bishop Stortford, I can remember playing rugby every Sunday. And like me and both my brothers are quite small, and we must have got well. I did get run over quite a few times playing rugby, and definitely wasn't a natural rugby player. But I still loved it, and we got soaking wet and freezing cold every Sunday, and still went and did it. So I definitely had that affinity for just being outdoors and, and, and games. And then I guess having two brothers, like, yeah, when, when we were in Bishop Stortford, we, the house we had there actually had a big field behind it and we were, we were always out in the field building dens and, and playing. And I think, I think if I'd have been a single child and moved to Lockbrook, and it, just, it would have been a very different experience to the one of having that journey with two brothers because you've got two mates to go and play with after school every day. So. Let's go on to um, the big question of what you're working to achieve or impact as a reluctant leader. A long way to go before you shuffle off this mortal coil. Uh, having listened to a, f- a couple of your podcasts, a few of your podcasts before and, and spoken to you, clearly you went down a path, not of free soloing, mountaineering, but you, you found yourself in the, the mountains of Europe skiing. And I think you, that's where you met your wife, I believe Sarah, took you on the, sort of the path to where you are. So perhaps you could just chart that, that little journey. Yeah, sure. I got my, I've got one of my brothers to thank for this journey. Actually, he came out to the French Alps to ski resort that's part of Corsia Bell called Latania. And he came out to work in the chalet company. He did that for a season. And on the very last week of the season, I, I just said, oh, I'll come out with a mate and see what this is all about. Like, what's it like? And me and his mate went out and I, I, I was just instantly taken aback by it. And I just instantly knew I wanted to live there within a week and the following year I came out with my brother to run a chalet in, in the same chalet company. And we did that together for a year. So that was getting up, cooking breakfast to guests in the morning, skiing all day. And then it was cooking dinner at night and partying all night, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> we actually, I actually went on to do that for five years all, all in. And then I met Sarah and my wife here in, on the very first day we got here, she worked for the same company after four years of in together, we decided to go to Canada for a season. So we went to, to work in Banff. Well, actually, we went to go and work in a town called Fernie because Sarah's surname is Fernie. That's where the, the Fernie Jones comes from in my name. So we went to go work in Fernie, got there, couldn't find any jobs. I had a mate who was working in, in Banff in a ski boot fitting shop. And he said, oh, I've got a job available here. Do you want to come and do you want to come work here? And I was like, yeah, cool. That, that's great. Sarah managed to get a, a waiting on job. And so we did a year in Banff which was really, really cool. And I learned how to fit ski boots. At the same time, I had a mate in Korshvel who made skis. So he made skis from scratch. He built all the tooling and all the kit to be able to, to make these skis. And we just kept having a conversation and said, well, what about setting up a, a boot shop in, 
in the French Alps because like there's nothing in Courchevel. Web business plan, got a friend whose dad was quite high up in BA and said, I'll, I'll read your business plan for you. And he read through it and said, it's good. It makes sense. Like, yeah, like give it a go. And we gave it a go and opened that shop and another one and run those two shops for 10 years, which. Wow. First of all, ski boot fitting. So you just put your foot in a ski boot and that's it. You strap them in and off you go. Yeah, they're, they're notoriously uncomfortable. <laughs> the reason being is you've got like a, it, you're trying to do something quite difficult. You're trying to connect a, a body to a plastic product that's then attached to a ski that's, you know, up to one meter, not 80, one meter, 90. And then you're going to ski down the hill with lots of forces and lots of stuff going on. Really what you need to do in boot fit is you need to stop that foot from moving because as soon as that foot starts to move, you're going to get blisters. You're going to bang the end of your toe and your toenail will fall off. So actually what you need to do in the ski boot is you need to stabilize the foot with a custom made footbed. And then you need to get that foot into quite a well fitted tight boot. Now, normally when people try that sort of boot on, they'll just, they won't buy it. They'll buy the sides up, just go straight from the sides up. And once you start moving around the ski boot, it's actually very, very difficult to keep someone comfortable. Wow. That explains uh, a lot of my experience skiing then, now that I know that. <laughs> what, it, what it was as well is an incredible um, problem solving experience. So you've got to sit in front of a customer. If you're going to take lots of measurements to their foot, you're going to look at anatomy and lots of people are going to, their feet and their body is going to be structured very differently. They're going to have wider feet or they're going to have collapsed arches or they're going to have all sorts of things going on. You're going to make a boot that fits them, but then when they leave that shop space, you have no control over how they ski. So they can go and ski really, really quite out of position, for example, like really back seat in the ski and their toes are going to push against the front and they might ski really badly or they might really over tighten the boots. And so they're going to come back to you because the service that we offered was like a guarantee. So you come back and we will make sure that boot fits. And that's what the customer trusted us for. And they, and they got it for. So they come back a lot. So you've got problem solve a lot of issues that might be slightly out of your hands, always in front of a customer. So it's very like you sat down in front of a customer for nine, 10 hours a day, customer facing lots of conversations, probably where my, over that, over that time, probably where I've become less, I'm, I'm less reluctant now to talk to people or do things like a podcast, probably because I've spent so much time in the last 10 years sat face to face with all sorts of people discussing their feet. Kushval's probably one of the, the, the most desirable and affluent ski resorts in Europe. Why wasn't there a boot fitting service there already? Around, like, so in Kushval, there's a lot of rental shops and renting a ski and a ski, ski boot is much more easy, much easier than, than fitting a ski boot. Like, for example, some of the skis that these companies will be renting, they will be paying 150 to 200 euros. They will rent them out for 100 euros for a week. So within a week or, well, within two weeks of, of renting out that ski, you're starting to turn to the profit and it's much easier money. Like the boot fits and you've got to be trained. You've got to have a lot of experience. You've got to be willing for those customers to come back to you with complaints because they will do. And you've got to be willing to deal with that. And I just think, it's far easier to rent someone a ski and not to have to deal with that problem. So it, it kind of worked as a lot of shops were quite grateful we were there. We, we were renting out ski boots and skis, so we weren't crossing over on their business. I see. So it was complementary to the, the existing businesses. Yeah, very cool. Ah, ah, fascinating. So that took you on that path to entrepreneurship and uh, probably a fantastic lifestyle and meeting and engaging interesting people uh, a lot of the time. What was the, the pivotal moment that began that transition to you becoming this reluctant leader? I think there's, there's maybe one big one that we've gone on to in a minute, but I also think there's been a drip feed of actions or going ons in my community, in my part of the world that have fed into me wanting to change what I do. By that drip feed, I mean the changes we can see in our community and our, in our landscape and our environment from climate change. So. The boot shop was based at the height of 1650. So it was in a ski resort called 1650. So that's 1,650 meters above sea level. I worked in that shop for 10 years and I'd lived in the resort for another, at that height for another five. And actually during those 15 years, you could see the impacts of climate change. The, the main one being that it would rain a lot more over snow and so the temperature would rise. It'd cause it to rain a lot more. Around us as well at the same time, we've obviously got glacial, glacial melt going on and like pretty much incomprehensible rate, to be honest. In some places, up to 18 meters of depth from glacier can be lost in a, in a year. Um, so you can actually witness it and see it on the mountain? 
that melt. Places like Chamonix, you can clearly see it because there's the, the Mer de Glace, which is a really famous glacier that you can ski down. And at the bottom of there, there's a set of steps that take you up to the station that takes you down back down the valley. And you can, as you walk down the steps, they've got the, the high marks of where the snow was by, by year. And it's, it's, well, it's not on the steps anymore. <laughs> We're talking hundreds and hundreds of steps. And then I'm a bit lucky that I've got a bit of land with the house that, that we own. So, and we like to try and grow a bit of food. We've got some cherry trees, some apple trees, some pear trees. We've got a veg patch. And so I tried to spend, I spend a lot of my time outside, both skiing in the winter, but also in the summer, just probably a bit slower paced life, but just out there doing bits and pieces in the garden. And it's just becoming progressively harder to find that, that space because it's drying out. So it's a bit hot. Last year, for example, we didn't have a single piece of fruit on this side of the valley. The blossom came up pretty early. We had a bit of a frost, but also we had a lot of pillars for some reason last year, whether that's to do with the biodiversity getting knocked out of sink a little bit. And yeah, so it had all these like drip feed things going on that you keep seeing and you start to realize that climate change is having quite a big impact on your region and on your community. And I guess that started to make me think about what I what I was doing and what my, my role was in society and, and what, I, what I was doing in my community and what my job was actually. So I'd grown up in the Peak District where it was all about being in the outdoors, climbers by their nature and me and my brothers as kids as climbers, like super frugal. Like if we went climbing to Europe somewhere, we did it on absolute shoestring. Whereas Courchevel is the opposite of that. It is luxury. <laughs> Opul opulence, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get more opulent, to be honest. And I think, I don't know, I just don't think I felt that comfortable in you know, that role of just buying products and selling products. Like I don't, I kind of start to question myself as to what my role is in society and what I was doing. Was it, was it, I guess, worthwhile or was it important? Could I do something else? And that had been playing on my mind for a bit. We'd, we'd done, done a few bits in the ski shop. Like we'd addressed like some of the single use plastic in the ski shop and we'd start to do as much as we could within that organization when it came to thinking about its environmental impact and then kind of got to a bit of a barrier really, which was talking to the suppliers of the, of the gear, realizing that they didn't kill it. They weren't particularly forward thinking in their approach and didn't have particularly any ideas, to be honest, about where they were going to go. Had a couple of, had a couple of reps that were really good reps actually for a couple of the brands. And uh, one of them was there, he, he was a fly fisherman and he'd been part of a group that was suing the town of Annecy, well, the town of Annecy and the, the sewage works that had been, the sewage had been overflowing into the river so many times a year because basically it wasn't of a big enough scale to serve the town anymore because the town had kept expanding. And so he was quite frank when I'd asked him, like, what, what is the brand doing? And he'd be like, brand's doing nothing. Like, they're not anything in the pipeline. I remember one year he was really excited to go, Gavin would put like a, you know, they take us away for an evening once a year, show us a few things and show us next year's products. And he was like, oh, this year there's a slide about sustainability. And like, it was a slide about placing the plastic wrapping on the skis with with cardboard which isn't really going to make a difference and the kind of uh, strange thing with it as well is it was replaced with cardboard and then they wrapped around the ski two plastic ski velcro bands that would hold the two skis to get would hold it all together so there was two of those on there there was probably as much plastic in the two wraps that went around the cardboard as there was in the original plastic film that was on the product so it's this, these kind of conversations where you just, you were talking to brands and going nowhere. Everyone is aware, whether it be you witnessing what's happening within the supply chain and in the industry that you're in, the tourists and the people that are coming to the, the resort are probably abundantly aware. Also, because they're on the mountain, they're probably coming back year after year. They can see the impact of climate change. Everyone's probably aware. But people feel helpless and hopeless in terms of what do they do? What difference can one person make? And most people then just resign themselves to just carry on with their lives and, and maybe make some small incremental changes. You could have done the same thing. Did you feel a sense of urgency or a, a desire to do something? Yeah. No, I, I don't. No, I don't feel a sense of urgency, which is strange because for the, uh, a sport like skiing, the urgency is this should be there. They should. Everyone should be acting urgency and in fact like some of those same suppliers will will be quite open about the fact that what they're actually going to do is take as much money out of the system before it before skiing ends as part of like take as much as possible 
that's their company's decisions and their decisions. Why I changed, I don't know. I'd maybe it could be pretty easy for me to be honest to just continue doing what we're doing. Like the boot lab worked. We made some pretty big changes to staffing hours after COVID, which meant we we had three hour lunches, which is uh, it's great. That's that's very French, which meant I could go skiing every day. I would work for the winter, and then I wouldn't have to work for the summer. That was not money from from the winter trade, so you not have to work in the summer. So yeah, I, at times I do think I could have uh, opted for the the easy life in some ways and continue doing that. Uh, but I just guess as I start to learn more about climate change and understand the impacts and see the impacts, it's it's harder to just hide and say, no, I'm just going to continue. I just became less comfortable in that, in that idea of just continuing. I have transitioned to something slightly different and I haven't completed that transition yet. There's still some crucial bits missing in that, in that process, like funding. <laughs> but I understand like from my friends and other people in the industry that are embedded into the industry that have money invested in something like, for example, they might have the rental of a shop contract signed for the next five or 10 years, or they might have a long-term mortgage on that shop space. They, they don't really have an option to, to, to leave and move into something else. They're kind of stuck in that role. And even if they did want to go and do something else, that's not really the pathway at the minute to do that. I did write a blog recently about about the ski industry and about the direction we're going in the hope that some of those people would start to think about the direction that we're heading in and, and maybe it might give them a bit of an impetus to to sort of start to think about the change and start to think what might come next. And I, I think there's also something fairly crucial in this debate that has a mass impact on climate change, and that's fake snow. Now, in places like Italy, 90% of the snow that is on the piste is from snow cannons. So if you took snow wow. cannons out of the Italian yeah. ski resorts, you'd have 10% of the snow they've currently got. Um, and presumably 30, 40 years ago, they didn't need those snow cannons. Yeah, exactly. So before they didn't need them. Like now you couldn't, they, these places Whoa. couldn't exist without them. Um, and so I think when you talk about like pe- people see the impact, some of the impact has been masked because you can go and there's these snow cannons that have made the snow so it doesn't look as bad as it would look those snow cannons that went there right now. I think this year or the last couple of years, certainly amongst my friends and colleagues and people in the community, the conversations are much more open. It's things like climate change are discussed a lot more openly. It's more acceptable to talk about it. And I'd say the same is for people coming to a resort, like clients and guests. I'd, I'd say like it's more acceptable topic. What I would say is that there's very little examples of it, of, of people changing what they do because of it. Like this is half term here at the moment. So it's the busiest week of the holidays. Need the helicopter transferring people from the airport to the resort hasn't stopped flying for the last three or four days because people want to avoid the, the transfer on the road. So yeah, people, I think, understand the problems a lot more, but it's hard at the minute to see much change in how people are acting. Well, perhaps you could... Um explain or give a insight into the the actions you have taken that started with your one tree at a time and has led you to the reaction collective yeah so five five years ago now we decided to hold a repair day out of the front of the the ski shop it was actually the very first brexit day so brexit is obviously a bit of a contentious event for us because none of us knew whether we were really truly going to be able to stay here we had 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 an idea that we oh, would of course because you're um, british British citizens, so you, yeah, you, you must have been questioning. Yeah, interesting. Questioning, and a strange thing to experience when the country you're growing up with, it feels like the country you're growing up doesn't want to be part of your life in a way. It's a bit odd thing to say, but it, it's like it wants yeah. to extract itself from your life. It's, it's a strange thing to say, I suppose, but that, there's just like a bit of a sense of that. So, yeah, we decided to do something positive on that day. We thought, oh, we'll, we'll do a repair day. We'll do something that just, yeah, I just felt good. And in, in resort, it was a really quiet week because there was people thinking that the flights would be grounded and like you wouldn't be able to get back from resort. So actually a lot of people didn't book to come that week. So we just thought we'd just make call. And we held a repair day. And in the run up to the repair day, I asked all my friends a couple of weeks before, I said, do you want to bring any kit that you don't use, like any snowboard trousers, ski boots? jackets you don't use and what we'll do is we'll just sell them on the day and we'll take any money we fundraise from that and we'll put it towards some tree planting 
that was kind of a big trigger because some of my friends and colleagues and stuff start turning up with like four spare jackets, five spare ski pants. And suddenly we had this huge selection of clothing. Wow. Um, it's kicking out of people's wardrobes. Tons of it. We sold it on the day, raised 9,000 euros. So that, that kind of got us thinking as well was like, wow, there's all this stuff. That otherwise um, might have ended up in landfill. Yeah, I mean, it will end up in landfill and probably, probably worse than that, actually, probably get shipped great distances before that happens, like probably get shipped to places mm. like Ghana before it then ends up yeah. in landfill or incineration. Like the, I'm sure we'll come on to this later, but the carbon footprint of a, a piece of clothing at the end of life is still pretty monumental after that point. So we did that. And then at the same time, we'd been doing bits and pieces to the, to the boot up to the businesses. And there was other businesses locally that were asking like, oh, like we like what you're doing is their way to get involved. So we set up an organization called One Tree at a Time, which runs here in our community. We now have a community space and we do all sorts of sorts of things from that space. We have film nights, we teach sewing classes, bicycle repair workshops, workshops on how to make your organizations and company more sustainable training with different staff members and stuff. And we did that and that, that space has been open now for four years and it's completely self-funded. So it's totally funded from the waste in our community. Like we didn't have to take any loans out or find any money to set it up. We managed to do it for the stuff that was all this waste that people were throwing out. And it's become like this really, really special place locally. So we make quite a lot of our funds. We raise quite a lot of our funds from selling use ski instructor uniforms so a ski instructor might ski in a jacket for one or two seasons and then to be honest at that point that jacket probably is no longer suitable or waterproof for a ski instructor to turn up looking professional and to remain dry i get it a bit why it wouldn't necessarily work for them but that doesn't mean it wouldn't work for someone like myself who lives here who on, on a rainy day probably would choose not to go skiing like i would probably choose to do uh -huh. something else and so we started to get this quite good quality gear that had been used for a period of time. Some of those instructor uniforms as well would be for like the like at half term or East, you would have some extra instructors come in, like from Italy, for example, a lot of Italians come in in the half term in Easter, they're, they're part-timers, they come in to fill in the really busy periods. They would obviously need a uniform as well. So that uniform would be lightly, lightly used. And we started to patch over the logos because they don't want those uniforms out in the community because someone might be skiing in them badly, like, and they're meant to be a ski, mm. this is a recognizable ski school or ski instructor outfit. They might be in a bar acting badly kind of thing. So there was this, the brands and the organizations weren't keen on having that product out in the community. So what we did was we literally started patching over the logos and reselling them, which has been, it's been really good in two ways. Obviously it's kept a hell of a lot of product out of landfill, but the act of patching something like leads to creativity. It makes you get creative. Like it makes our community get creative. Mm -hmm. It's that we're, we're kind of involved in the process of prolonging the lifetime of that garment. So we've got three or four different, like probably five or six different people now that do the patching and we and patching it, each patching person, it with your, you've, cr but you've created your own brand to patch it over, or you've just patch it over with any piece of cloth. So we put the one tree at a time logo on, we stamped the logo on afterwards, which is really interesting because it's made a kind of hyper local brand that people are like, ah, oh, this is, this is cool. I want to be part of your mission. I want to get involved in your purpose. When we did start out, we were like, well, let's buy some pre-made patches to go over these logos, over these ski school logos. And I was like, ah, oh, just, I'm not happy with that because they will be made for polyester. There's no other way to make them. And they will, like, I got this mad vision, you know of a landfill in 200 years time. And on the top of the landfill is this one tree at a time badge. <laughs> like that's not yeah. right. So we sort of said, well, what can we do that is the, the least impactful? So what we can do is we can use the fabrics that we have in our community and make our, make our own patches. You know, like a lot, sometimes we'll get some garments in and there, there'll be a big stain down one side that we can't clean, but the other half of the jacket, the fabric's great. So why don't we take that fabric and use it, use it to patch and then stamp our logo on it and simply just do it with a an ink and stamp it on it kind of looks cool kind of looks like a got a bit like a graffiti image to it because it's stamped it's not perfect and then but what we said to the people at patch is you do it how you want to do it we're not fussy about what this looks like as long as it's 
patched and it looks cool. And so each person that patches has almost got their own style. So everything is really like unique, one off. We've got this logo on it's kind of hyper like the local brand really. And our community loves it. And it's really good because when I go skiing now, I can see a lot of this product on the hill, which is really cool. That's amazing. So who who's wearing it? Quite a mix, actually. Like even so there's an interesting thing we've done actually that has surprised me so we we received a, a lot of kit from a, a chalet company because they were cutting down their staff numbers because of brexit so a lot of the way organizations operate out here has changed quite dramatically because of the way brexit, brexit has affected employment and they gave us a lot of uniform and at the time we were like oh my god i have no idea what we're going to do with all this so what we actually what we actually did is we patched up about 50 of them and gave them to some ski shops in resort. So I've got a friend who runs a couple of ski shops. And I gave him to him and said, right, why didn't you try rental ski gear? Because no one else is doing rented ski gear around here. I mean, your only option if you are if you lose your bag on a flight, for example, your only option is to go and buy new. And the prices here are phenomenal. So we did that. And he's put them in the two resorts that he's in. And one is Meribel, one is Courchevel 1850. Now, Courchevel 1850 is the probably the most exclusive ski resort, if not one of them, if not most exclusive he was on the like luxury we actually rent he actually rents a lot more in 1850 than he does in in Maribel. and he rents it to people who are traveling long distances to come skiing who might just be here for a few days and very very wealthy people that can afford to buy kit but they actually are not forced uh-huh. and they'll just use something else and that surprised me like uh, quite shocked by that to be honest that's amazing so that opens up the opportunity for conversation in these these rental shops or the shops where they can say, well, what's this one tree at a time, or what's this? Re- is it is it now Reaction Collective that you're branding it with, or is it still one tree at a time? Still locally, we brand it as one tree at a time. And I'll come on to the Reaction Collective and uh-huh. like kind of why that happened in a minute. But yeah, we still the, the sort of hyper local brand is one tree at a time. But it is yeah, it's what is actually quite difficult with trying to introduce sustainability and conversation into the mountains here is that people on holiday. They don't want to talk about it. And generally, it's quite a difficult thing to bring into conversation, which I, I kind of get if you if it's your one ski holiday a year. Like, although you can yeah. be seeing it all in front of your face, and climate change is going to massively change the way we holiday and the way we ski, it's still something that you probably just don't want to think about or talk about for that week. So yeah, it, it's it's good in that sense, and I mean, most importantly, it's really helped create a lovely, vibrant community a local community of people here that you know it's helped feed into that community so i've got a lot more french friends now i've got a lot more english friends because of it when we do workshops there's a good mix of italian french argentinian english sat around the table doing the workshop so there's been there's been lots of positives from that 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 side of it from like building up a community and the space is the space is actually something really special it's become something really quite interesting and I think it has become really interesting because we have very much kept it fluid and structured it to whatever the community wants it to become. And so, for example, outside the front of the shop, we have a great big rail that is for children's clothing and it's just a swap rail. Like you just put some clothing on there and you take some clothing off it because I've got two young children now. They've got ski gear that will fit them for this winter that will not fit them for next winter. And so I might as well swap it with someone in my community. Like. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Things like that. We have like a swap board where you can put requests up. So you can say, oh, I'm trying to find us inside in the window. I'm looking for a snowboard in a minute. Can you just put it up there? And we'll like try and connect people and say, oh, this person's looking for a snowboard. Do you want to give it to them or buy it off them or, or whatever? But we've been really good at just like allowing the space to become whatever the community wants the space to become. And that's just made it really like really exciting, actually, and a really cool place to be. It's, it's mad now. It's at, like during the week, it's absolutely even. We've got, We've got an old age person's home in, in the small village that has recently accept, started to accept a lot of people with mel- mental health issues and they will come and hang mm. out in the shop space. And they've kind of been placed in this space, in this village that it is quite isolated in a sense. There's not really any other shops to go and buy clothing in. Like our village is quite small. And so they've got moved there and they might not have things like winter boots. They might not have a winter jacket and they just come to us and go can i have one and we're like yeah we've got a garage full of them just take like yeah here's some boots here's some winter jacket go take it and so they come to that space now regularly just to chat like just to hang out and it's become this really cool spot and i think 
because it's not a traditional shop, because we're not thinking about consuming and se- like selling, it's not, you know, we're thinking about like, oh, what event can we have that people will come to and attend? You know, what thing can we put on that our community needs? It's It's got a very different relationship with our community. So it's just really well supported. That's brilliant. The, the purpose isn't for profit, it's for community and it's for building community spirit. It's fantastic. I just think about whether it's in Scotland where my family are or here in Austin or even just thinking about when I lived in New York. That type of community space is, is, is just need, it's needed everywhere because everyone's feeling the, the pressure, whether it be in Britain with Brexit or whether it be because of just the impact of rising prices in inflation and the overall impact of what's been happening around the world since the global financial crash. There's a lack of community spaces. What you're building is what feels like there's, a, there's an urgency to create an alternative to the system that exists at the moment that clearly is fracturing and fragmenting. And it feels like you're building something that is more purposeful and has value for the community. I'd agree. And I, I, what I would say as well is like, we have high streets at the minute that are really struggling to function. It's actually quite difficult to run a business on a high street now. We've got some quite empty high streets all over Europe. And that's probably because the internet has, you know, taken, taken a lot of business away from a lot of those organizations. It's made people don't go out as much maybe, but I kind of see an opportunity to really revitalize the high street because the, the things that we're going to need going forward are we are going to need things like repair we are going to need things like swapping and sharing the resources that are already in our community like and and we're going to need community we're going to need the space where we can all to come together and 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 help each other like Mm -hmm. i I kind of feel quite strongly that the world is going to become much more local like it's going to become much more localized Mm -hmm. like i mean i i i can see it in the ski shop like when I was in the ski shop for the last few years, I can see the disruption that's happening to, to, to supply line, like COVID, Ukraine, but also as well, like climate change is going to disrupt that supply line. If it, I, I would probably say it already is, but it's going to disrupt it massively. And it was getting really, really difficult at times to get the stock in that you needed to be able to, to sell because it just wasn't getting manufactured for various reasons or the supply lines were, were, were disrupted. And so... We kind of need to build our economy around things like repair, around reuse, around sharing our resources that we already have, around lo- local stuff. Because if you don't structure it that way, if you structure it just about bringing stuff to Europe or to the UK cheaply, and your economy is structured around just reselling cheap products and they're just not on anything that's like like a high, like on a, not got a skill involved with it, then if we do have big disruptions to that supply line, there, there isn't really much of a function in the economy. You end up mm-hmm. with a space that, you know, doesn't have, you've not got the skills that you need within that economy anymore to, to be able to reuse the stuff that's there. I mean, you're talking about just there in your, in the ski shops, it's, 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 I suppose it's ski fashion. And we just think about the impact. You talked about landfills in Ghana. We think about the impact of fast fashion, that it's the second biggest contributor to uh, global emissions is is the fashion industry. I think the Ellen MacArthur Foundation estimated that a truckload of abandoned textiles are dumped in landfill and incinerated every second, and that uh, um, it's estimated that people are buying sixty percent more clothes and wearing them for half as long. And if that's just a, a, a fact that's related to general fashion, you know, you've got to think about it in terms of just what's happening within the, the the industry that you're you're servicing, which is the ski industry. And if people are feeling the and are unaware of the impact that that's having, you're creating an an alternative to the problem we're all abundantly aware of. And as you say, if supply chains are being affected by whether it be geopolitical pressures or it be because of COVID or whatever else, or just the growing awareness that there has to be an alternative. What is that? What is the alternative? And what you're building would appear to be an example that sustainability is about how do you make a community sustainable not just sustainable in terms of the supply chain but in terms of how healthy the community is how you, people come together and commune and have conversation and exchange and create micro economies and i think what you're describing is an example 
that other communities can probably learn from to show that actually there is an alternative, that we don't have to be as profligate with the way that we've, we live and what we buy and what we, and what we dispose of. When, like when you give those stats, and, and I've got quite a few more stats I could add to that, and I've learned whilst I've been going through this journey of, about various things about the fashion industry and the, the impact of it and stuff. The couple of stats that really kind of blow my mind is that in the, in the UK each year, the equivalent of 2.4 billion t-shirts are exported in the second-hand trade. So that's, I do not, episode 1.4 billion, 1.4 billion t-shirts exported in, in the second-hand trade. Most of those head to Germany, where they are then sorted, and they head off to places like Ghana, um, Poland, other places. I think that is actually regarded as being recycled. And the other one is that brands often will order over 30% of the stock, 30% stock more than they believe they will need, because it's better not to sell out. Like selling out means that you've kind of lost, lost revenue on a product, so they'll traditionally order anything up to 30% more than they believe they will need. And I... I've worked closely with a couple of ski brands and I can see that they're, they're doing that. And what they will do towards back in the season is they will put those things on sale for like 70, 80% off, off RRP to try and try and shift them. Now this stuff just gets disposed of. It just gets incinerated or it just gets shipped abroad. And it's, it's mad to see that system that we've created. And in that fashion system, I'm really struggling to spot like the winners, like the the people within that system that are winning from that system, even like like someone like myself, who you would probably think, oh yeah, you're living in the West, so surely you're kind of winning from that system. You know, you've got access to cheap clothing. Actually, like I'm dealing with all the waste and all the impacts from from that system, and my community is dealing with all the waste and impacts from that system. Like people are leaving this stuff in our community after they've been here for the winter season or after they've been on holiday. Obviously, people at the start of the supply line, the supply chain, who are manufacturing these products, we know aren't, aren't paid particularly well or aren't living in, are not working in good conditions. Obviously, the people after us here who uh, get to deal with the waste that we can't deal with, that's stuff that they can't deal with either. So I think the it's kind of hard to, it's kind of frustrating from my position. So. In, in a normal charity shop, when you drop clothing off at a charity shop, somewhere between 15 and 25% of what you drop off will remain inside that charity store for resale. The other 75 to 85% will get shipped abroad. It will get moved somewhere else. In our space, because we work creatively with the products that come through the door, like we repair them, we use them for patching, we'll use the fabrics in the school, we'll make new products out of the fabrics we actually keep about just a somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the stuff that's donated to our shop space we actually keep it in store uh, we'll also screen print for example over say we've got some t-shirts that are good quality but they might have a stain on them we'll actually screen print over the stain so that t-shirt can get resold but the reason it works is because we're really creative and we've built a community around the the action of keeping that that product there and it you're right it kind of works and it's kind of frustrating for me to look at an industry and see its impact and difficult to figure out why it's been structured like that even from a waste perspective like why have we structured the waste end of the system like that as well why are we just shipping most of it abroad because if you think if you came into our shop space with a bag of clothing but you've had a sort out home you've got rid of some of your excess clothing you've got rid of some of your things that would have felt probably feel like a bit of a burden to you. They're filling up your wardrobe space. You're like, well, I'm going to get rid of these burdens. I'm going to go and, and give them to someone else who will do something good with them. So my burden is gone. You know, I feel good. If you uh, came into my shop space and give them to me, you are just passing your burdens on to me and our staff. And we then will sort through your, your kind donations. <laughs> we will use the things that we can, we will reuse, but there will be a large amount of that product in there that we probably can't reuse like it might be you know some of the bags we get donated with some of the damaged and stained and and old garments are really 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 un unusable but you've walked away from that system going oh, i've done the right thing i've given this to someone that's going to use it that means i can go and shop and fill up that wardrobe space again is is like this is what i would say is the psychological repercussion of that action then we have to sort it and keep as much as we can and what we will actually do if a product it's really, really bad and it is poor fabric, poor material, poorly stained, broken. 
we will try our hardest to make sure that it doesn't go into the clothing recycling bin that will then ship that product to places like Ghana. We just try and make sure that it goes into the landfill because we know if we can't deal with it here in our community because it's of such poor quality, there's just absolutely no way if we put that into a, a recycling clothing bin and then it gets shipped to somewhere like Ghana, someone in Ghana is going to be able to deal with it. It's, it's not possible. We don't have the we don't have the facilities in Europe to deal with it. So we try hard so what to do make you do sure with it doesn't get part of that. If you don't ship like, it, if you keep it and that's a, a big problem. I mean, people are working on fabric to fabric recycling at the minute, non available out there really at the moment. Yeah, obviously if you could I I would still say do what we're doing, try and keep that garment in its in its original state for as long as possible. If you can't keep it in its original state, use the materials as much as you can in your community to repair something else or to do something else. But then if you get to the end of that and you have this product that's just not usable, at some point material to material, fabric to fabric recycling would be be great. But to be honest, I don't think that's gonna happen with ski gear because it's it's often like two or three layers of different fabrics bonded together. So I don't know like how far away we are from that to recycle that. If we're talking about the impact, the economic impact of what's happened with the with inflation, with recession, the, the impact on what we're witnessing everywhere around the world, which is homelessness, wouldn't there be an opportunity to actually then at least take that material and turn it into some form of, whether it be a tent or at least some sort of protective covering that people who are maybe having to live on the streets or can actually get access to so at least it's staying in having some sort of purpose yeah i think there would be i think you could structure an industry like a, a small industry around that to be honest and one thing we've been doing where we get a lot of black salopette black trousers black ski pants so often you know they might have like a stain on them or they're they're from a brand in the first place, they only cost 10 to 20 euros. So actually trying to resell it and trying to give it away is sometimes mm-hmm. quite difficult. What we'll do with those is we've been doing a project where we've been stitching several together to make a basically waterproof sleeping bag that is just a waist down sleeping bag. So it, what we've done is we've taken some of the ski jackets we've got, we've built these, we've made these sleeping bags that go from the waist down that then attach into these ski jackets which means you can use it on the street at night, you can sleep in it, but in the day you can roll up the sleeping bag quite easily and still still wear the jacket so you're not having to transport mm. like, every, and carry everything around. And we've stuffed them full of ski socks because we've got loads of ski socks. And we've made them so that they can be rolled up and uh, clipped together so that you can sit on them in the day. But yeah, yeah, I think there probably is an opportunity to do so. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say, I, was going to say, I, think, there is, I think there probably is an opportunity to, to do stuff like that with this waste because it's it's hard wearing as well like it's it's ski gear that's designed to be in the outdoors the plastics are going to last you know quite a few years if not hundreds of years before they biodegrade fully fully degrade fully before they disappear they're strong materials they're strong fabrics that are designed to be in the outdoors so i think that's why we've had quite a bit of success in our space is because we're actually working with a product that's quite durable in the first place what we are doing is definitely more difficult when you're working with everyday clothing especially at the moment with the quality of that product like the the quality of the everyday clothing that comes into our shop space now is almost getting worse year on year like the build quality the fabric quality the thread the thread quality like the, the thread count in the in the garments is it's just getting less and less so that stuff is really really difficult to work with whereas the things you're talking about like the the outerwear turning it into a tent fabric or turning it into sleeping bag yeah, it's, it's definitely definitely durable so you created an, an initiative called, I believe, called Citizen Friday. Could you um, walk us through that? I can. And maybe we just maybe we need to go into what happened to one tree at a time before I get to that Citizen Friday because that's actually yes, yeah, part yeah, of, yeah. Uh, okay. Of, so All right. I'll, I was I was speaking on another podcast and the one tree at a time, like I say, is working really well. It's really good space in our community. It's a joy to be there. It's self-funded and these podcasts. Someone on this podcast asked me, like, how how could we scale the impact of of what we're doing? What we're doing, and honestly, my first thoughts is like, I did didn't want to scale the impact, and there was a couple of reasons for that. One, I don't want to get into that position of opening 10, 20, one tree at a time spaces. I just there's a lot of difficulty in that, a lot of stress, a lot of hard, like really, really, really hard work to make that happen, a lot of risk, and I 
I was just a bit didn't want that to become my life in a way. And then secondly, I, as I said earlier, the one tree at a time space is created by our community almost. And I think taking that and transplanting it into another community isn't necessarily the right thing to do. But I'll jump in there. It, you don't have to do it, but other people could do it. Other communities could take your initiative and could build something that's relevant, takes the same model of what you're doing and transplant it into their community. And that's, I think someone else must have said something very similar to me at the time, <laughs> because the result was that we, we decided to form a collective, uh, which was called, is now called the Reaction Collective. So someone did say to me, how about like a network or collective of organizations? And immediately I was like, oh, that, that sounds way more interesting. Like that mm. sounds more exciting. It sounds like it can scale a lot quicker. So we decided to form something called the Reaction Collective, which is now a global network of 40 organizations they're taking they're working within the circular economy within the outdoor industry so they might be working in skiing climbing I've got conversations tomorrow with some cricket which is really cool but just in in sports and and the outdoors and they're working to just keep kit out of landfill so they might be doing that through repair they might be doing it through reuse like second hand they might be doing it through repurposing so there's a few organizations in there that turn like waste fabric into to things like you described into 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 other items. There's some companies in there that are redistributing, so they're receiving kit and they're getting it into the hands of people who want to experience the outdoors but can't necessarily uh, afford it. And so yeah, we started this collective of 40 organisations. Well, we started with about seven or eight, and within a year we've got about 40. And we share ideas, we support each other, we share. Uh, materials we share resources we we use a discord channel to do all this which is actually it's a really really on a personal level it's a really joyful place to be because it creates a lot of resilience it's resiliency in me it gives me a lot of hope it makes me feel part of something much more there's a channel on there that's called a winds channel and essentially you you put your win on there and then we all go and share that win for that you know collectively across instagram or linkedin or whatever but that wins channel like you can be having yeah you can be having a pretty poor week uh, and you thinking oh god like nothing's going on this is hard at the minute and someone shares a massive win on there so you're suddenly part of their you know you're part of their story and you're like great like you know i had i had a particularly hard week it must have been been two years ago in the summer we had a forest fire that you could see from this window that caught in august and it ended up burning for nearly three weeks it was a tough old week. Like it was a tough week to watch that, like from your window to, to see that happening. And it was extra tough because at the time my, my son Noah was only about 18 months. And you know, I just remember uh, sitting, feeding him food, like nourishing him, like looking after him with this like forest fire in the background. And I just remember going, oh God, like this, this is hard. <laughs> I've bring I've brought a child into this world and look what's going on. But and it, that did knock me, that did knock me at the time. But there was stuff going on still. Like I was still part of something where some action was being taken and we were progressing and there was some movement and there was a community around me that were gathering around me to go and like there to talk to and to chat through about these, these things that you're feeling. And so, yeah, this we've got this, this collective space that's just, again, a real joy to be part of. It's fun, it's creative, it's, yeah, it's exciting. And 40 organisations across how many countries? Uh, so we've got quite a few based in the UK, but we've got a few in France now, New Zealand, um, a couple of organizations in the US, one in Budapest as well, which has just joined. They're not all running community spaces. It's a mixture. There is some some community spaces. There are some not-for-profits. There's a physical shop space in the Peak District from where I grew up that we're working with, where we've introduced secondhand into that physical store, which is a really, really cool thing to be able to do to try and help them transition like an, an existing company, an existing organization that, yeah, you know, is owned by a great, a really good friend of mine from school. And he got in touch and said, I think this is what you're doing is amazing. Like, can you help us? We really want to change. And so there's a reaction collective rail in there and a drop off space. And what we've helped them do is partner with a repair organization locally that then repairs any of that kit and then they resell it in the store. Mostly when you drop off outdoor gear in, a, in, a, in an outdoor store, like the outdoor store will shift it, they'll ship it to somewhere else, they'll donate it somewhere else for it to be used. Whereas we want to sort of displace a bit of the new the sale the new sales with second hand. 
I'll tell you a, a good organization that you should connect with. Well, I could try and connect you here. I'm a, mem- I, I'm a member of my local gym is the Y. I go into the local one here down, it's called Town Lake. It's down by the Lake Austin. And they have a bin, which is a recycle your, your running shoes. I don't know where they go. I, mean, I have absolutely no idea, but people donate them and they just go in there. I should find out where those shoes end up and if there, there's an opportunity there for, if they're working with someone that's doing some form of recycling. And, because there must be an opportunity, the scale of the why of all the gyms, they're all over the US and they're, you know, they're driven by a greater purpose and profit. So they would be a yeah. perfect partner for your collective. Yeah. And like when it comes to shoes, for example, they are running shoes, they are a difficult products probably one of the more difficult products to get reuse from but we have a member in the collective um called pair ups that repairs trainers so he, he's like he's getting the number 500 to a thousand kilometers out of a, out of running shoes by selling these repair patches and how to do them and how, how to patch at home yourself and so there is like skills within the collective that i believe that, that's kind of the point of the collective that we can share that we can go on a journey with mm-hmm. why and figure out like what 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 is the best thing to do with them shoes and you know like i i wouldn't have the answers but someone else in the collective will like they'll be working in that space you exactly know, I'm focusing on how, how to ski gear. i think the the inspiring thing is it's more than just sharing your your kit and repurposing it it's the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of skills that's fascinating so i should have said who a set reaction with up with actually so it's set with the co-founder is heather so heather she Used to work in a shall she used to own a chalet company here, transitioned into doing marketing in a ski school. And then after that went and did a she went to the course at Cambridge University in the sustainability leadership course on marketing. And then she's transitioned into marketing around sustainability. And so Heather Heather was obviously naturally drawn to what was going on at One Tree and we were having these conversations and I started talking about this idea of like, oh, I think we could build this collective and we could, we could scale and like we're both so, and I thought, yeah, like this is cool. Let's go with it. And I don't think when we started, and this is what's quite nice about reaction, it's still quite fluid. Like it isn't, you couldn't really pin it down and say, I actually don't know what it's going to look like exactly in five years time, which I feel is a strength because it's, it's about our community. Like there's no, the power is completely distributed. No one has more say over anyone. Like I have no more say in that space than any other member of that collective. We're all very equal. Everyone's opinion and point of view. Is, is, is the same, is, is not the same value. And I think what we've kind of realized, and we've definitely thought this in the last two weeks, is we've actually created something quite, quite special and quite interesting just, just by following our noses and going down this path. It's kind of naturally got us into this position. And there was one key decision Heather and I made, like we set out and we still haven't, we, we, we haven't, we still haven't figured out the funding exactly, but we thought at the start, well, maybe our members should pay to be part of the collective. That's where the, the funding should come from. Like from the beginning, I thought that was not, I don't know, it didn't sit comfortably with me because if I put my one tree at time hat on as a member of reaction, I'm paying a monthly fee. I'm thinking, right, what am I getting back? Am I getting enough back from this organization? Am I getting what I, am I justifying my membership? Whereas when you take away that membership fee, so when you say, right, it's free to be part of this collective, you suddenly switch to like, oh, what can I do for it? Like, what's my, what's my role to grow in this thing, to helping the people within it? Like, how, how do I help grow this community? Like, what's my, my give to this community? And I think that when we made that decision to say that we'll figure out how to fund it in another way and that to be part of this collective is completely free. You just got to get in there and like in that there was a, a switch in how it, how it was operating and how it was working. Yeah, because in fact, as soon as you start introducing fees, it, it sounds like a union. You pay your dues to be part of it and you're going to be represented. And what are you doing for me looking after my interests? So it does, it, it flips it from being almost like a hierarchical system to being flat, and distributed. I listened to a podcast someone advised me to listen to the other day uh, called Team Human. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was your yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, Rushkoff. Yeah. Yeah. So I listened to the Carney Ross episode on your advice. And you advised, you said to listen to the bit about anarchism and it was really really interesting and i didn't know the meaning actually i didn't know the dictionary definition was what it was and in there anarchism talks about a a distributed power a level playing field like uh, and also no obligation so i think once there was money involved there was an obligation that we would return something 
or they would get something or you know i guess you might want to grade when there's like when there's money involved you might want a grade that you can stick on your website say we're graded five out of ten or we're graded nine out of ten like we actually don't want to do any of that because we want people just to be getting on with the act of like discovering what, what we can do what can come next we don't want to be embroiled in like the the act of recording data and saying oh this is this is right and this is wrong we just want to get into creating something different and something new and so yeah i think we have created something in that in that framework by chance mm. by chance almost by yeah by accident it's quite quite interesting well i'm i'm sure at some point you know it will emerge the the funding model and how whether you become whether it becomes a, a philanthropic funded venture you know i think it is something that it will just that solution will emerge that you've made the decision not to make it fee based i think that's the interesting thing it's that whole journey seems you seem to have been on this journey that is almost it it started with you with one tree at a time and it's it's evolved into something that's much bigger i think the same way that you're trying to, you don't need to consciously decide what it'll be the solution will come to you probably through some form of serendipitous conversation or connection. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what does emerge uh, and how it evolves into becoming something that is not just 40 organizations, but 400 organizations across maybe 40 countries. Yeah, I agree. And like, actually, like we've stumbled upon loads of solutions from start to finish. Like this wouldn't be what it would be without Heather's input. It wouldn't be what it would be without Heather's ha husband Andy's input. He's a website designer. So these solutions. And I think when you start to do something that's fundamentally good and positive, and it has a, a clear mission and a clear purpose, kind of this, the good stuff comes to you a bit. And it, it just happens upon us because we're putting ourselves out there and saying like the system or what's happening in our community isn't right. We want to do something different. We want to be part of that, but we actually want to take some action. We're not just saying, you know, we're not just saying the system's really bad someone else do something about it we're saying like oh it's not looking great and it's not great for our community like what can we what can we start to build and what action can we take i think people just naturally gravitate to that yeah i'm not concerned about funding actually i feel like it, it will like you say it will materialize some some way we'll, we'll figure it out what is it what do you need the funding for where where the <clears throat> where's the cost in, the, in terms of the good thing about what we need funding for is we don't need a huge amount because it's a collective so we need to be able to fund the core team to be able to keep things working. That is what we would like to create next is what we're terming the toolkit, but it will not just be, a, it will, it will be placed on different places we've done on the internet, but talk it how to set up spaces like one tree at a time in, in your own community and the actions that we've taken and how you can take simple steps, like putting on a repair day or just doing a close swap day, or even just getting your community together to watch a film so that you start a conversation about like what your community might like to do. We want to build that next to, so that there's a way for everyone to get access to the, the information and the stories that we have. So like it's, 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 it's certainly not like, it's not crazy amounts of funding, which is the beauty of it. It's quite a resilient organization in that sense, because the power is distributed amongst all its members. If one trip at a time in 15 years, has to close because we've lost all the snow around here, for example, like we don't have as many tourists here, for example, we've not been able to figure out a way of funding it. I'm sure we will have by then, but figure out a way of funding it differently. There's the rest of the collective still there. There's still stuff functioning. It's not like we've lost everything. And that, that feels really powerful to me as well. And it goes back to that idea of like, if you're having a bad time within an organization or an organization struggling a bit, there's a lot of support around you from the collective, but also you can see that other good stuff is going on. So you continue, you know, you stay in the game, you keep pushing because you can see this stuff is growing. What you're building is an inspiring organization, which is a, it's in a way what you're creating is an alternative to the, what John, John Alexander, who we both know is, has termed the citizen story and not the consumer story. We know that the consumer story, what he talks about, is broken and is, is being torn apart and is uh, leading to people feeling uh, disconnected, frustrated that they're contributing to a system they know is, is, is damaging to people and the planet. But people feel 
hopeless and helpless because they don't can't see any alternative. But you're creating an emerging structure that is an that does prove there is an alternative to the consumer story. This what John calls a citizen story. And although you've got organisations that are forming part of your reaction collective, they don't have to be the ones contributing to the funding for it. I mean, I came across your organisation by seeing you on LinkedIn. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is an example of what John talked about in the Citizen Story. You're, you are an exemplar for it. People, individuals who go to these organisations and they benefit from what they're delivering, they could be the members, they could be the contributors to it. I mean, I could see a situation where it doesn't have to be the organisation in, in America or the organisation in the one that you mentioned in the UK. It could be the people that are, they want to be part of a new system. So I could, I could see a way of saying, okay, I want, I want to be a part of your reaction collective as a citizen. And I'm prepared to get access to your Discord channel to be able to read about, to be able to feel I'm a part of something bigger, not as a, a citizen of the United Kingdom or a citizen of the US, but a citizen as a part of the Reaction Collective, because I want to feel I'm contributing to a better future in any way that I can. And if that means being able to say, OK, I can afford to give um, $100 a year to be part of the Reaction Collective so I can get access to meet the people in your network in the Reaction Collective that are local to me in Austin or local to me in Edinburgh. What I see is sort of the emergence of a network of people who are taking, having agency in building and being part of building something that's better than existed before. If the system, as John says, is in a, we are in this transition, then it's not just organizations that have to become part of the Reaction Collective, it's, it's people, it's citizens. And maybe that's where the, the funding model will come from. I've said a few times recently to people in passing in meetings and stuff that we have to figure out a role for the citizen within reaction. That's kind of our next step. Like we've got these great organizations that come together. There's more coming all the time. Now for everyone's benefit, we need to connect those organizations with, the, with citizens, with people who want to take part in, to use their services or even like go and volunteer with them. Like how can we, the one tree at a time shop here we've got plenty of people who come and volunteer in our space because they want to get involved in that way and we just we we just need to be able to figure out an effective i guess is an effective platform an effective way to feel that you're involved as a citizen yeah but i do see there is an opportunity and i do think quite that you know like part of this process of setting up reaction was definitely led by reading citizens i definitely read that and had a real connection with the, with the book and with the story i think i don't think it made me go oh i'm a citizen i think it made me go mm -hmm. ah remember when i used to live in the peak district when i was a young kid and mm. i wasn't a consumer i was a citizen then and then i've come to this place in the mountains and got dragged into the ski resort a bit i'm not really a citizen anymore i'm a bit like my life's got a lot more about it to do with, it's a lot more about consumption and it made me go, ah, oh, like, I remember that. I'm going back there. So I've gone back to to my roots a little bit. And in a, in a sense, I feel much more like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a citizen again. Like I, the consumer story never really got, it's never really got a grip with me. It's never really got fully on, it's never really got hold of me because growing up in the Peak mm -hmm. District, I didn't have access to shopping. It wasn't, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't possible for me. The first time I lived anywhere that was near or accessible to a shop would have been when I went to university, but I didn't have any money. So I never really bought into the consumer story then particularly. And then where I live in France, because of where I live, I don't have a TV. Uh, so I don't get to see much advertising in my day-to-day -day life. I live outdoors in the mountains. It's, it's easy for me to go a long time really without seeing a, an advert, to be honest, like it doesn't it isn't around me. I'm not surrounded by it. And John talks about how now some people are seeing up to 10,000 adverts a day, um, which I, I, I feel quite lucky that I don't experience that. So I think the book really made me go and think about that time. It made me go back a little bit to that time and it, it, it made me question what I am as a person and my role. And it did feed, it definitely fed into our work. But yeah, I think like we're entering into that story of what it means to be a citizen and i think we have to figure out 
like how we can fund an organization within that story as well. Because we've got nothing, we, we've not got something that we want to sell for people to consume as an organ, organization. So we do have to do, and maybe, maybe the thing they want is access, like you say, to the group. Maybe they want to be part of the collective. There is a book called The Innovator's Dilemma by a guy called Clayton Christensen, who uh, sadly died a few years ago. He discussed the concept of disruptive innovation, usually uh, giving examples of how high, uh, how high tech brands or how the technology disrupts industries. When I started reading and, and finding out about more about what you're doing, it did feel like what you're actually doing is disruptive innovation, but in a low tech, what I call high community um, disruption. Because you're what you are beginning to do isn't just disrupting a sector, you're disrupting traditional business models. Because if you, if reaction as a collective scales and communities and groups emerge in different countries, in different localities, what you're going to start to see is the emergence of upcycling, recycling, resharing, swap shops happening en masse, which is actually going to force traditional businesses to evolve their business models, to embrace the type of thing that you're doing. Because they, can't, they couldn't ignore it. Because they, they either go out of business or they evolve. So it, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what brands like Patagonia, who are already a, a brand that's committed to, you know, if you think about what they did in Black Friday a few years ago, about 10 years ago now, getting people not to actually spend money and go out and buy, but to actually repair. You know, it was a thing that got me into buying the Patagonia brand and being a committed Patagonia sort of buyer. But other brands will have to take your lead because if they don't, the group, people will start to go, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to reap, I'm not going to buy with that brand because they're not purposeful. And I'm going to be committed to actually helping and working with my local community to make my local community sustainable. As you say, we're, we are in a, um, a time of transition, but we'll probably start to see a move away from globalization to much more locally driven, sustainable economies where craft skills start to reemerge from people learning how to use sewing machines and, and, and repairing things and creating something at a local level rather than relying on these fractured supply chains. There's a bit in that that I'd like to see Patagonia change within, within their model. And Patagonia have been really good at growing the idea of repair within outdoor products. It's been, it's been a really, really good, the work that they've done to encourage people to repair. And they've done it by offering free repairs on their equipment for life. The, the repair on that equipment isn't technically free. Like the repair on that equipment will, I think, come from, I believe it comes from their marketing budget. And so they're not, it's not actually, it's free to the, to the user, to the consumer, citizen, I should say, free to the citizen. But it's not, it's not technically free. And actually, if you think of our space one tree at a time, what we would like someone that needs a Patagonia jacket repaired to be able to do is still get it repaired in their local community by someone who is skilled at doing a repair so that they can, they can trust. And either they pay for that service or Patagonia pays for that service. Because at, at the moment, you still, you still send that product off to be repaired and you send it. So in Europe, you send it to a centralized place in, in, in the Netherlands and, and that's where that repair will get carried out and then it will go back to you. Whereas I'd much rather see us or like Patagonia get involved in building the network like we are, where they are actively supporting the reemergence of craft and, and trades within these communities. Because at the minute they're taking that, that repair is taking funds out of our community, like money that could be spent here, but it's taking it elsewhere. I think you, you, you said like disruptive tech and disruptive community. I think maybe the interesting thing is that disruptive community could scale like really quickly, couldn't it? It could, it could scale like super fast. And maybe even John mentioned this in the podcast she had with him. Maybe he mentioned this in about the citizen story being able to emerge quickly in, in, in a sense, in the fact that it's kind of the citizen story is in all of us. It's like the oldest story. So actually like it could emerge really, really fast, but the same with what we're trying to do, like a network could grow incredibly quickly because it's about being a part of a community. So it's about people. If we can shape and make that space where you, Mark, feel part of the reaction collective in a, in a meaningful way and you feel like you're involved and 
then then your neighbor feels like they can be involved or someone else in your town and suddenly you can have a really quick and scalable impact and i think that's that's why i said earlier when we've with reaction what it's been really good at is we've never fixed ourselves in 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 one position like it's con constantly changing it's constantly shifting sometimes week by week and so we're able to move into that space and interestingly we did make another decision early in this process that that helped that as well is we did have some brands who manufacture stuff go oh this is cool like can we join your collective and there would have been an option there to say yes and to try and influence what they do but actually we decided to say no like we want to remain free to do what we need to do and to go where we need to go by all means use the services of our members so if you want to get you you know if you want to find a partner for repair based in france then speak to the guys at one tree at a time or if you want to find a partner for repair in the uk go and speak to th these people like use them but actually like this collective is about something different it's not about existing brands that are manufacturing stuff like we we want to be able to remain separate so that we can't disrupt we don't kind of want to get emerged into the play and not, like into the system i know we have talked about sits and friday but do you want to quickly cover that because It'd just be good for you to explain what that was and anything else you want to highlight. Yeah, so uh, Citizen Friday was a campaign that we ran in response to Black Friday. So Black Friday, like when, when you talked earlier about the fashion industry, well, and the fashion industry has integrated and has, has made its way into the sportswear industry and the out, out to wear, out to wear industry. Like people change the colors every year. They change the fabrics, they change the zips to try and increase purchase more. And like Black Friday is a big part of the outdoor industry. You'll see lots of sales and they run up to it. And so we decided that we wanted to sort of do a campaign against Black Friday, but something that wasn't just against it. It was something that was positive, something with meaningful action you could take. We're just going to say again, oh, Black Friday's rubbish. So we came up with like, well, Heather came up with Sits and Friday. And the idea behind Sit and St. Friday was repair, share, and get some fresh air. So the idea was that in, on, on Black Friday itself, don't go consume, go and do these things instead. They're better for your community, they're better for you, and they're better for the environment. And actually, like the whole campaign went down really, really well. And I think it's because it was quite simple to be involved. You could take part in it. Like, you, you had a role to play and probably has caught the, the attention of people just because of the of the, the situation we are in the world at the minute. And maybe people don't have as much expendable cash and spend and, and, and as much money to spend and stuff. So they fancy doing something maybe a bit different. Like maybe they, they want to do something that's a bit more for them or for their community. And it, yeah, it went, it went really, really well. And it's continued since. Basically, I do sits on Friday every week. I've decided that I will cram my work in elsewhere and then on Fridays I will spend the time with my two young children and we tend to go outside we go ski touring I strap them both onto my back we go ski touring or we go skiing we go bike riding and then just do stuff outside that that feels good for me and for my family and we're gonna yeah so we continue that campaign people are still doing it they're still joining in and it's a way of it's a sort of stepping stone into the work the, the wider work that we're doing at Reaction. And so, yeah, it's been, it's been a really cool and well-received project. On a note of what we need, <laughs> I know you talk about random collisions. Mm. Like, from start to finish, this has been one journey of random, well, it's not finished, but to start to where we are now, this has been one yeah. journey of absolutely random collisions. Like, one after another, after another. We just need to keep that going. Like, we just need to keep getting in spaces where we meet people who think they might have some help or they might have a role to play or they might have an idea to just keep coming on this journey with us. Just going back to what you said about you had brands approaching you, you didn't want to be part of it. What did they say that was uh, the appeal of the collective that made them want to be part of it? Good question. I mean, once we'd spoken to them and had a, like an instruction meeting, it was clear that it couldn't work. So maybe they didn't know enough about what we were up to and what we were doing. At that point as well, we didn't have, we, we've since created a very, like a, a short manifesto. It's, it's sort of seven or eight points about what we do. Such things as like embedded in the circular, we're, like, we're pushing with the circular economy, we're building communities, we're sharing skills, we're sharing knowledge. Like once we'd built that and, and it, it suddenly when a brand looked at that, they realized that they couldn't really tick that manifesto. They couldn't say that they were 
doing all of those things. So I think probably at the time it was maybe that we were more towards the start of our journey. They didn't actually really know exactly what we were up to. We hadn't fully established exactly what we were up to. Do you think there will be a role, potentially a role for brands become participants? I think the best thing they could probably do is help our members, like the member organizations, like act, actively act with those. So there's a great organization, for example, called Kidda. And the Kidda platform is a sharing platform for children's sports gear. So you would just um, yeah. list your kids' sports gear that they've grown out of and you can swap it or you can resell it. Now, they've started to work with like cricket clubs, sports clubs, uh, football football teams, professional teams that have excess kit that they don't know what to do with and it's probably ended up in landfill and they're starting to work with them by listing it on those sites so that children can have access to this this kit. So I think like the way brands and, and a couple of brands have come to us and said, look, we love what you're doing. What parts of the collective can help us with our journey? So there's like, we've had some meetings with a brand where the repair organizations are going to help on the repair side of things, the repurposing organizations, the organizations that turn waste fabrics into new products are going to help on that side of things. So I think there's a way for the collective to be involved, but maybe to be involved with the, the member organizations itself. But again, like we don't know, like this is not fixed and maybe at some point there is a way for that to work. So is it, are we going to see an emergence of a new form of business structure that isn't driven by profit predominantly and it, it, there's an acknowledgement that there has to be a, a business that will emerge that will have recycling resharing built into its business model an evolving type of business that is inherently built to satisfy the citizen model rather than the consumer story and maybe that's that's what, what we are yet to witness that fundamentally says we're going to actually sort of build a business that steps away from the traditional model. And that's maybe a conversation we should take offline. I agree with that sentiment. And actually it's part of the reason why we try to remain separate from the industry at the moment, because we can take on that role as disruptor. And maybe part of what we do is finding out what that might look like, like the things that we're working on might feed into that. So yeah. It would be an interesting, it's an interesting conversation to follow. And I think it's going to happen probably in some way, that form at some point. Maybe it's a, a reimagining of what the cooperative was in the UK and going back to actually your, your roots in the Peak District. Maybe what you're beginning with the, the Reaction Collective is the foundations of a new cooperative society. And I... I also think what is going to kind of, I feel it's kind of going to happen now or next is that actually like we, we're, we're focused on this sector, on the out, outdoor sector, but the stuff and the things we're doing, they can translate us to, to other sectors and actually like, why not like a collective of collectives? Like why don't organizations that are working on slightly different things, but within this kind of idea of purpose being the main driver, start coming together and, and, and and work like more closely and can can we create something that's fundamentally different amongst us yeah well it sounds like lots of further conversations to be had a couple of to some personal questions who inspires you or what oh, who or what ah that, that actually like who i think i find just inspirational in, in kind of just friends and ordinary people you know people that are like making their way in a very complicated difficult situation like i'm inspired daily by my, my mates and what my wife and what my friends and colleagues are up to like i i actually have never maybe because i've never been that bothered by the consumer story i'm not really that inspired by fame or or, or yeah not really inspired by fame so I, I generally just find inspiration in the people around me you talked about the the struggle when you witnessed the the forest fire last year you're going back to what you said you're a reluctant leader but you are actually sort of leading us into uncertain territory. We don't know where we're going, but you have a faith in what you're doing is the right thing. But you must have to deal with those moments when you're waking up in the middle of the night with Kai, uh, moments when most of us face our fears, uncertainty and doubt about what we're doing and where we're going. How, how do you deal with that on a, on a daily basis or when you do encounter those, those doubts or fears? 
I think I'm able to deal with it because I've placed myself in a collective of organizations that are doing stuff or in a community of people that are doing stuff. I think, you know, like seeing that forest fire again, like if I'd have been seeing that forest fire last year and still just fit in ski boots, I think I would feel really, really like quite, I think I'd find that really hard and be like, God, I'm like, there's a fire out there and I'm fit in ski boots. Like what, what's going on? So I think um, in answer to that, I, I, I think the only way to sort of build that resiliency and, and to approach that is to build a bigger community and, and build a collective of people around you, rely on their support and that network because it, it is tough. And that is, it is especially, I feel it is I would say hard for lots of people, but it's, it is quite hard when you see that constant reminder of climate change, like on almost, it's like a weekly occurrence or a daily occurrence. And that's, that's quite hard to have that in your brain all the time going, oh God, like, you know, for, for example, we have got stuff that's popping up in the garden right now that is six to eight weeks ahead of where it should traditionally be. You know, we're, we're way like spring is, is way, way early. Like we've almost, if it doesn't cool down in the next couple of weeks, it's spring's going to happen in February, which is, you know, and you, you go out and you see that on the daily reminder of that. And that's really hard to absorb that. It's really, it's a constant thing. And I think I can only. The thing, the, 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 the skills that I've got, the thing that I found that makes me be able to handle that is to be able to talk to people in my community that understand it, that are working on positive action, feel, you know, feels like we're doing something that is meaningful, like we're going somewhere different. I love that term, reluctant leader. But what would you like your legacy to be? This is a strange thing, probably, because of what I'm doing, it feels like you, you would assume that I kind of want, I really feel like I want a legacy. I, I don't particularly feel that I have to leave a certain legacy. I don't feel like it's something that I have to have done and left behind. It's, it's not really, it's not really, that's not really why I'm doing this, I guess. Obviously, I, you know, I could say I've got two young children. It'd be lovely to leave a, a legacy of a better planet behind, but you know, I'm a person amongst a population of 6 billion. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm that person that can, that can, that can play that. I can have a role. I can do something with my community. I can, I can try, I can try and reluctantly leave and see if it takes us somewhere, but. Yeah, I just don't feel that I have a great urgency inside to, to, to leave some kind of legacy. I guess like I absolutely adore my two children and my two time and my time with my two children is insanely good. And I guess a, as a legacy, I'd like to leave behind two lovely adults or yeah, to make sure that they grew up in a, in, in, a, in a positive way. And you mentioned you didn't have a television. So I'm assuming you read a lot. So aside from the book Citizen uh, by John Alexander, is there any book you would recommend people pick up and read? I'm going to give a bit of a strange answer to this, maybe. I'm going to suggest something else. I, I, I'm going to say, like, if you can, take some of that time and get into nature and into the outdoors and just have a little look at what what is happening right at this moment in time. There's lots of people posting today on LinkedIn, for example, that spring has started as well in the UK, again, six to eight weeks early. And I think collectively, we just need to reconnect with nature and, and quickly. And I think actually just getting outside, spending some time in nature would be really, really valuable. And I find a lot of value in that. Go and meet nature, learn from nature. Okay. Well, that was my next question was about, is there a life hack? And I, su I suspect your life hack would be get into nature. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's my life. Hack, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, certainly I'm going to be connecting you to other guests and, and, and continuing your process of random collisions. So I think it's a few people in the impossible network you need to speak to, including Omar Freya for sure. And I'll definitely yeah. be having conversations with the people at the Y here in Austin and uh, to see if they can, uh, take up the mantle of the reaction. Uh, collective, because I think it uh, it needs to to spread. So, final question: Who should I interview next? So, um, <clears throat> I was back in the UK last year at a conference, and I met a guy called Alex Fish, and he runs a CIC called Ninety Nine P Films. It's a social cinema club, and you pay ninety nine p to go. You can pay up to I think it's up to twenty pounds, but the cheapest ticket price is ninety nine p. And you go and the wow. first section of the evening is a breath exercise just to get people relaxed and, and in the mood. And then you watch some documentaries and they'll be around the subject. He's based in Cornwall, so he does a lot of stuff around, uh, he's done some 
or some evenings on organic food. They've done some evenings about the emergence of AI. They've done some evenings about the sewage problem that they have in the UK currently. And then at the end of watching the films, you have a feast. So it's a, usually a, a vegan meal that's cooked using local produce. So it's benefiting the local farmers in that, in that area. And then you discuss and you can do that for night and 99 P and 99 P from each ticket goes towards a local uh, filmmaker to make another film documentary about a local subject. And brilliant. I just think it's an amazing, amazing idea. You know, like it by, <clears throat> by, by being just 99 P to go along, watch something, chat, mm-hmm. have some food. It breaks down all barriers to entry. Any, anyone can go. And I just think it's a really, really cool idea. And actually one of those ideas I think can the same can be scaled mm-hmm. across, across the globe. In a, in a similar way, Definitely, like a really yeah. powerful way to bring people. That's fantastic. Is he part of the Reaction Collective? So this is a little bit when I'm talking, when I talked earlier that I quite like the idea of a collective of collectives. We, when yeah. we want to build this toolkit, we want to think of ways that you mm-hmm. could start to do something within your community. So it might be that you've put on a repair day, a reaction repair day, but you might also mm-hmm. put on like a reaction 99p film night. So we might have a set of films that you can show for mm-hmm. free. This idea of like bringing in organizations like his into our into a like collective space so there's different bits and pieces people can pick well the same way i mean it it triggers just the last two guests i had on caroline arditi who uh started a thing called the sunshine hour during covid and she now runs these dinners where she brings people in for these home cooked dinners to for to build community Edward Malkenbar in uh, Caroline's in Paris. Edward's in uh, Holland, and he's starting the thing called the Social Impact Tour, where he's taking, uh, finding stories of impact and trans people's lives transformed, and taking it on a tour around Holland and people coming into a theatre and then contributing to help these people, these stories, and by committing to help them. Again, it's triggering. I think what all these these people are doing, they're creating a sense of taking action themselves and creating agency and a f- sense of their people can do things individually and collectively to transform lives in their own particular way. And I think your idea of a collective of collectives, when these people all start to, and this is what I've talked about as well, when people start to connect and hear the stories of what people are doing, like 99 fi- P films, you go, why isn't that happening in Austin? Why isn't that happening in New York? Why isn't it happening in San Francisco? Because the scale effect of that is immense. The impact it would have on communities. Yeah. So I think we, yeah, you're definitely onto something. Yeah. And I think it's, it's and I think we, we did speak about this the, uh, the other day or we have touched in the past and like, oh, there is back. Is that, the problem that we, one of the barriers that we have at the minute is people knowing about what we're doing, is people knowing about our story. And obviously it's great to be on mm-hmm. things like this podcast because it's just reaching a few more, like reaching more and more people. And we actually mm-hmm. need a platform or a way or a space for all of these stories to get celebrated because then people will understand that there is a lot of stuff going on. Like there's all these different things emerging at the same time and there is agency and there is, there is hope. And it's hard at the minute for us as an organization to cut through actually to reach reach people just because the traditional platforms reaching people say your your instagram and things are, are about the consumer story they're about selling things and we're, we're not selling yeah. anything other than the sits and lifestyle it's not it's not something that instagram particularly wants on its platform so yeah if we had a had a way of bringing all this together and spreading the message that would be amazing well i'm sure this will not be the last conversation we have on the subject so I look forward to continuing the conversation and uh, yeah, helping you any way I can. So thank you very much and uh, yeah, and best of luck. Amazing. Thanks, Mark. That was Great. Really, all really right, good then. to speak to you. Okay, that's all for now, folks. Now here's my ask of you: please follow this podcast on Apple or Spotify or whatever player you use. Also, please subscribe to our new Random Collisions newsletter. We really are working to build a global community of action takers, action engines of people that really care about the problems that need solving. Thank you very much, and see you next time.